Well, I, I'm really excited to be here today and introduce Wynne Hogart. Um, let's see, I was thinking what I should say about him. And my first experience with Wynne was um, in the streets of Ixtahuacan, a small town in, in Guatemala, as I was walking down the street and some kids calling out, Wynne, Wynne. <laughs> Um, and that was three years after when Hogart had been to Guatemala as a field study student. And then I learned um, that he lived with the De Paz family, who I also lived with, and, um, and started hearing about Wynne Hogart and this great legend. Um, and so when I got back, I wanted to find out who is Wynne Hogart. And it's been great to, to learn about Wynne, and it's great to see what he has done since his um, experience in Guatemala. Um, Wynne Hogard uh, went in 1995 to um, Guatemala as a field study student and worked on a documentary. And since then, he's worked on many films and documentaries. Uh, he's edited um, many documentaries dealing with other cultures. Um, for example, here, here's a, a small list of um, Le Afi Uamu, The Fire is Burning, and I'm sure he'll talk about all these. Um, Joseph Smith, the Prophet of the Restoration, uh, The Best Two Years, Saints and Soldiers. He's worked on these films as editor, co-editor, and consultant. Um, and it all started in a small uh, community in the highlands of Guatemala. So I'm really excited to see and to hear from Wynne Hogard and his experiences. Um, and so, and hopefully you can see what field studies can do for you as a uh, student, as, your, um, as you plan for your future careers in whatever field of study, whether it be in film or botany or um, uh, social sciences. Um, so we'd like to give, uh, we're grateful to have Wynne Hogard here. We'd like to give him a warm welcome. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, my first question is, did they ever ask you a not let see? Do the dog? Um, I fully blame that for them asking about me, because uh, hopefully you'll see a little bit later. I've got a little clip prepared, but it should explain that a little bit. But uh, to start off, hopefully we get this going. Tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, General Donovan and his brigade will take these men to the town square in Far West, and he will shoot them! Try it again. General Donovan and his brigade will take these men to the town square in Far West, and he will shoot them! Don't be afraid, Joseph. God will take care of you. Ask, and you shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. I couldn't let you come. 4,000 miles below. You've never even met this man. I don't need to meet him. To know he's a prophet. I don't blame anyone for not believing my history. If I had not experienced what I have, I would not believe it myself. Hey, Joseph! You seen any visions lately? It's time we got rid of these Mormons for good. If we need to kill Joe Smith to do it, all the better. <laughs> the worth of every soul is great in the eyes of God. All right. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Um, I just started off with that because it's one of the one of the things that I've worked on that I feel the most proud of, the, it's my proudest moment, I guess you could say. Um, I don't know how many have seen, the, uh, seen that show up in Salt Lake, but uh, yeah, uh, it, 
let's just say that when my brother went to go see it, uh, he sat down there and he felt that this was one of the main things that I was called here <clears throat> on earth to do. And I'm already getting emotional, so it's kind of silly. But um, that project was definitely one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. <clears throat> And uh, as Malcolm said, mostly it all started in a tiny little village down in Guatemala. And uh, in many ways, my wife's here, and uh, it's kind of all her fault I ended up down there. Um, it, <clears throat> it's, kind of a, it's kind of a long story, but uh, for those of you who know, who know Dr. Hawkins, Dr. John Hawkins over in the anthropology department, who usually goes down on the, uh, the Guatemala trip, he, uh, his daughter ended up being uh, in, with my wife on her mission down there in Guatemala. They ended up being roommates later, and so when I was dating my wife, I got to know Claire, and uh, at a mission reunion, Dr. Hawkins cornered me and said, now you're a film student, right? I said, yeah, want to do your senior project down in Guatemala? And up until that point, I really, you know, I had planned on being an editor. Uh, that's really all I wanted to be and hadn't really ever thought of uh, going off and doing my own little documentary. And uh, so, you know, initially I kind of pushed it off and didn't really think it would, you know, I'd go and do it. But time went on and uh, one night I told my wife, you know, that sounds like it might be kind of fun. What do you think? And so I ended up going down and... Uh, and doing that, but uh, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But uh, um, just a little bit more, uh, a little bit more about myself. I was born, raised in Utah, up in North Salt Lake area, Bountiful. Um, I have five brothers and sisters, so there's six of us running around. And uh, you know, went to high school up there. Actually, graduated with a uh, an acting scholarship. So I kind of wanted to do the entertaining thing for a while, but uh, uh, that was up to Utah State and decided to come down here to, to BYU and started out in communications and then changed over to film eventually. And I have not regretted it ever since. Um, and uh, you know, while I was here at BYU, like I said, met my wife. We now have four little youngins running around and uh, tormenting the neighbors and whatnot. But, uh, uh, we still live here in Provo, and, and uh, are, are, I guess we're having a good time, as near as I can tell. But uh, um, as the uh, little uh, poster says, now I work full time over at the LDS Motion Picture Studio. I've worked uh, many years as a freelance editor, and that's when I was able to do all these, uh, you know, silly, obnoxious Mormon films that have come out, and. Uh, Hopefully some people get a chuck, chuckle out of them here and there, but uh, um, as for field studies, so I ended up down in Guatemala, and uh, honestly when I first went down, I really, you know, that was the first year and we had no idea what we were getting into. Uh, Dr. Hawkins had been down before, but he's mostly stayed in a, another part of Guatemala. Um, and I'm not sure in the details on how he decided on these two villages to stay in. For those who don't know, there's two villages that they usually stay in, one called Nawala and the other one's Santa Catarina Ishtawakan. And that's where I ended up staying and uh, I'm very happy that's where I stayed. It was a much smaller town and uh, took a half hour car ride and over dirt road to get there. So, but. Uh, um, but before we get a little bit more into that, uh, I just wanted to show you another. There's a show that I worked on called uh, In the Presence of Healers. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Steve Olpin. He graduated from BYU a few years before I did. And uh, lately he's gotten more into uh, bike movies and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, early on he did a, really, a lot of really good documentaries. And this is one about uh, a professor named Paul Cox who used to be here at the, the university. Uh, he calls himself an ethnobotanist, and uh, first time I heard that, I thought that was kind of bizarre. But he studies cultures through the plants, and uh, I'll just play a little <clears throat> clip here of a show that we did from there because I feel it it has a lot of good little information uh, on what you do on a field study. Oh, that's the wrong one. Good thing it didn't go. 
There we go. Maybe. There we go. This is a rainforest here. Occasionally it rains in rainforests. Um, and sometimes people, when they come into a rainforest, they get very upset when it starts raining. I mean, one of the great things about the natural world is you can't control it. You don't know what's going to happen. You might even get wet. I think if you really want to understand plants, you've got to be like a plant. You've got to get down in the mud and look up at the canopy of the forest. You've got to imagine what it's like to be a little seed just pushing your shoot up. Being an ethnobotanist is like being a cross between an anthropologist and a botanist. Ethno means the study of indigenous people. Botany is the study of plants. And you've got to be able as an ethnobotanist to understand both. We have tried through our technology to create these cocoons around us, to completely homogenize our environment. And coming and confronting the natural world forces us to jettison that comfort zone. What did my colleagues think when I started hanging out with witch doctors? I'm about like what they'd think if they saw me using fern spectacles. Uh, they thought it was completely crazy. Uh, word went around, Cox is taking a sabbatical and he's living with witch doctors. I think sometimes we need to get out and get wet and to get cold. To feel a little bit different than we ordinarily feel because there's just that possibility. We might see the world in just a slightly different way. Sometimes when you have a raindrop hit you in the eye, it just might alter your vision. My mother had just died from cancer. I got to watch her die, and uh, although she was very brave and struggled very sternly, it made me really wonder, what, what can I do to help human health? What can I do to do something that uh, would mean something for medicine? And I thought, as a tropical botanist, maybe my best chance is to go to the South Pacific and live with uh, witch doctors and shaman and healers and sort of be Peter Pan for a while and uh, look around the world in a new way, not through the eyes of a scientist, but the eyes of a witch doctor, try to learn how they think, and lo and behold, I discovered this completely humane and sophisticated... Sophisticated way of healing. <laughs> uh, not sure what happened there, but... Uh, um, there's three things in there that I like. Uh, that very last statement about... Uh, getting to know the witch doctors. Uh, it kind of goes along with the other statement, one of the other statements that very early on, everybody was chuckling about how he's being the plant. Um, you know, he got down and dirty with them. And, uh, you know, if we want to understand people from another country or anything like that, you've got to live with them. That's one thing that I really loved about the, the whole Guatemala experience is we stayed with families. I stayed with a great family, the Tapas family, and, uh, you know, I felt like I was one of them. And although I didn't know Quiche, but uh, um, as long as we spoke in Spanish, everything was fine. But, uh, um, and then I really like his analogy about the, the raindrop. Um, you know, you can, uh, you can be in a place all you want, and maybe you're looking through it through your own glasses or your own point of view, but uh, if something happens to you and, and knocks your perspective, you, know, you, you can see the area in a whole new light. Um, and uh, there's something else that he said. I, I don't remember hearing it uh, right then, and now it's all of a sudden gone from my mind again. So maybe I'll think of it in a minute. But uh, uh, oh, uh, basically, the, the, uh, at one point in the film, he says uh, that you know he, he was trying to find uh, you know he's talking about he went and lived with these witch doctors. Uh, and he's trying to find specific answers to, to specific problems, how they do, you know, there are certain kind of healings. And he wasn't getting the kind of answers he expected, and he basically says that, well, it took me to learn that I had to write, that I had to ask the right questions in order to get the right answers. And uh, I think in, in that case as well, if we're in another country, if we're trying to understand other people, 
again, we've kind of got our own little perspective and we're only asking these certain questions, we've got to try and learn how to ask the other questions from different angles uh, to try and get the, uh, the answers to uh, what we're really looking for, to get to the heart of the issue, I guess. Um, so ask the right questions. Um, now, I titled my thing The Importance of Story. Uh, it was kind of odd to me that uh, I had titled it that because um, I think it was Wednesday last week I was actually caught, you know, they asked me to do this and uh, on Friday I was involved with a phone conversation uh, with a group of editors from the uh, Theater Media Arts Department and they had called a, an editor that works down in, in Los Angeles. Uh, right now he's working on a uh, reality show, actually, no, he's working on a, uh, a telenovela. Uh, it, I actually saw it televised uh, on, or a commercial for it on Channel 14 the other night. And I've forgotten the name of it now, but uh, anyway, he's basically a supervising editor and he's been working since the early 80s as an editor down there. And he just time and time again, he brought up the importance of sticking with the story. Uh, you can throw in all the effects that you want into a film or a TV show or, or a documentary, but if it doesn't promote the story, if it doesn't help it go forward, then it's not really doing what it should. Uh, specifically, he was talking, you know, since he's supervising all the other editors on this show, he said that a lot of them have come from reality TV uh, down there in LA. And, uh, yeah, I was thinking, well, in a way, that I guess that's kind of a field study, but uh, reality TV isn't that reality. Uh, just as a quick side note on that, I have a friend that uh, works down in L.A., and uh, he, has a, he knew a guy that worked as a cameraman on the Amazon Survivor, and he took along his own little mini DV camera and did some uh, filming behind the scenes and whatnot, and uh, mostly of the Amazon, because I guess he wasn't allowed to, to do anything of the show, but, uh, and he asked my friend Rob to make a dub of it and uh, you have this mini DV tape so he could watch it and whatnot. And, um, my friend Rob said that while he's doing the dub, he, every now and then he'd hear the, the phrase, okay, can we get the talent back to one? Which means, okay, let's get him back and let's do it again. So yeah, it's not really that reality. It's all kind of canned, but uh, anyway. Um, the importance of story. Uh, you know, you, Everything, it, and now I'm specifically talking about films, and so I don't know how many of you are interested in doing films. Malcolm said some of you are interested in going down to Guatemala. Some of you might be doing a film down there, but, uh, uh, and to be honest with you, I've never written a paper, a, a, an ethnographic paper or anything like that, but the closest I got was uh, uh, this film I did. But, uh, you know, when you're dealing with a film, you, you need to stick to the story. If you vary it all, people can get bored. They'll change the channel. Uh, and uh, let's see, he, he mentioned three things. He said, know your film. Uh, in that sense, he meant read your, read your script, know what it's supposed to be. I think in a documentary sense, that would be know your topic, know exactly what you're trying to, talk, you know, what you're trying to tell people. Uh, in my case, when I went down to Guatemala, like I said, we really had no idea what we were getting into. We, I had a few ideas of some topics that we do, like, uh, oh, uh, Dr. Hawkins said Nawala had a nice factory of mano y matates, the, the corn grinding things, uh, nearby and suggested I might do something on that. And I can't remember a few of the other suggestions that he had, but I had a list of things to do. And, uh, you know, went down there and as soon as I got down there, I realized most of those ideas were not going to happen. I uh, ended up sitting around for a while, well, not a while. Um, we, we, we got to Santa Catarina then and uh, during the, the, our first week there, there's three big things about, you know, problems with deforestation. Uh, you know, the, the army came to town and confiscated some wood from uh, uh, two big uh, oh, chainsaws, I can't, or taladeros, uh, I can't think of the word in English, but uh, uh, just, what'd you say? Lumbermills. Lumbermen, yeah. So, it, and, and you say lumber mills, but there it was actually just individual people that w would supply the, the wood because it wasn't that big of a, you know, they weren't that big of a uh, company or anything like that. But, you know, they were starting to make a dent in all the trees around. Um, the one night that kind of drove me crazy was uh, uh, 
I was in the Tuch, which is a uh, sweat bath. And uh, you know, I was having my nightly bath. And apparently, while I was in there, the, the town bell started ringing. And everybody, everybody started congregating around the, ch the church. And uh, uh, apparently, there's a big to-do, because there's a big truck trying to leave town in the middle of the night. Well, not in the middle of the night, but during the dark part of the night or evening. Uh, with a huge load of wood, and everybody got mad, and some fists were flying, and uh, anyway, and I missed that, and nobody bothered to come get me with the camera, and so I missed that too, but, uh, uh, and then uh, apparently somebody decided to sell their little chunk of land full of uh, trees to somebody from the outside that they were going to come in and start chopping down trees, and townspeople heard about this, they all hopped on a bus and ran off to, to stop them, and well, we were having our tourist day somewhere else that day, so I missed that one too. But anyway, all that happened in one week. And uh, so I kind of took that as my clue. Uh, hurried and dug in on that and, uh, uh, and started uh, shooting stuff about deforestation. And it was very surprising how many people had opinions on it. I mean, I talked to anybody, and all of them had some sort of opinion on it, whether they were for it or against it. Um, there were very few people that were kind of indifferent because they all depended on wood, uh, whether it was uh, just for daily cooking or for their livelihood. So uh, anyway, maybe I'll uh, let's uh, I'll show you a little clip from that right now, and uh, let's see. Actually, go over to that one. If it will go. Cocinan con leña y se baña con leña porque se baña más la gente en Tamascal que en agua fría. Esas son costumbres mayas. Nosotros no aguantamos, digamos, bañar en agua porque no estamos acostumbrados. Donde bañamos siempre en el Tamascal. Allí siempre. Each family builds their own Tamascal. Using very little water, this sauna-like structure provides a rich and invigorating bath. For centuries, the Maya have used pieces of resin-filled pine called okote to transport the flame of the fire. These highly flammable sticks of wood are used to ignite the firewood needed to warm the sweat bath. After about an hour, the sauna is ready for use. Okote is made by peeling a strip of bark off of a pine tree. As it sits for the next months, the tree's sap slowly flows into the exposed area, causing it to turn red. After about six months, the okote is ready to be harvested and sold. These small bundles of okote will sell for about three cents a piece. Okote and other sap products also hold a more religious meaning. These bundles of copal, candles, poem, and incense are made for use during a Mayan ceremony. A recent revival of traditional Mayan beliefs and customs has brought about an increase in these rites and ceremonies. Many Mayan altars and almost as many Mayan priests can be found throughout the region. The rocks surrounding such areas are often burnt black by the many rituals of fire performed in their presence. King Nistao Campos es una cultura Maya porque todavía la familia, el hombre, la mujer viven de la naturaleza. Nosotros somos raza maya y la maya eh, quiere decir que él mismo trabaja, él mismo hace su leña y él mismo eh, cultiva todas las cosas que, que lo consume. Lo que entendemos nosotros es que tiene que haber una relación entre hombre, naturaleza y Dios. O sea, eh, los tres tienen que tener la misma importancia. Antes Ellos protegían todas las cosas que Dios ha dado y han valorado. Sí, 
En cambio, nosotros ahorita ya no estamos valorando nada, nada más. Lo que ya se entiende ahora de que Dios es más grande. El hombre está y la naturaleza es mucho más inferior. Entonces, yo puedo hacer daño a lo que me es inferior. Outside forces combined with the town's growing population have created an environment unknown to previous generations. With fewer jobs and less land available to more and more people, many are forced to find other ways to support their families. Hay mucha pobreza. Por eso ellos se han tirado a la tala de arroz porque es un trabajo que de negocio y ellos siempre consiguen un poco más dinero en talar árboles, árboles que sembrar milpa y frijol. Okay, so that was a little bit longer clip, but uh, the main reason why I showed it to you was, um, you know, we didn't always talk about deforestation. I want, mainly I wanted to show uh, their dependence on wood, and it's not just for cooking, it's not just for, uh, you know, livelihood, but other uh, things as well, like, you know, for their Mayan ceremonies. Uh, and that was an aspect that, you know, until I went, I had no idea that there was people down there doing these kind of things. And... Uh, to see this group of uh, Mayan priests all doing their thing on this side of the mountain, I, I felt pretty privileged to, to, to see that. But uh, um, So again, know your story. Uh, do all that you can do to study your topic uh, beforehand uh, so you're knowledgeable on, of it, knowledgeable on it. The worst thing I've ever seen is somebody go down and try and do an interview and trying to fake that they know something's, you know, fake what's going on, that they know what's going on. And uh, it it usually doesn't go too well. So. <laughs> um, the second thing he said was, remember the story first. And this is kind of where he said, you know, don't sacrifice uh, the story for, you know, throwing in schnazzy effects and stuff like that. Make sure that the story's good, and if the effects fit, then sure, throw them in. But, uh, you know, make sure that uh, uh, the story comes first. Nobody's going to want to watch a, sh a show of any kind that's kind of vague about what it's doing, even if it's MTV style. Um, that only lasts so long. There needs to be substance to it. Um, the last thing he said was, story is everything. Again, we're back to story. Uh, I took that to mean as, uh, as to mean don't get sidetracked on other topics. Uh, yes, you can kind of slightly go off for a minute or two, or, or a few seconds, just um, I've got a few examples later on that we may or may not have time to get to, but where you, you, you stay on topic and you sneak these other facts in just as uh, facts. Did you have a question? Could you just define what you mean by story? Do you have a definition of story that you share with us? Uh, what do I mean by story? Uh, that would, mean, that would uh, depend on obviously what we're talking about. Uh, whether it's a documentary. In my case, in the, in the Quiche film that I did, I would say it's you know, the, the story about deforestation and how it affects those people. Uh, you know, in some of these other shows, like the Joseph movie, obviously it's dealing about Joseph. Uh, that was kind of a rough go of it because there is so much, and we're given this little time uh, to do it, that we actually had to cut. Initially, we submitted a, an 80 minute, 82 minute uh, version for approval, and uh, they said cut 15 minutes out of it. And that's hard. That was hard. And there were parts of that story that. Uh, I still wish to do this day that we could sneak back in, but uh, um, you know you've got to do what profit asks. So, uh, but uh, I, I'm still fairly happy with that movie. But so story, that's basically what you have to decide from the beginning of the the project. Uh, if you're going into it without an idea of what you're talking about, then that's the whole problem. Uh, you definitely need to know what your focus is. Uh, so, I don't know, are you interested in doing a film down there? Are you going, or? I, I, I studied film. I just got back from filming in Europe. It's not a film where I get to write my own. Okay. So. Good. Excellent. Uh, and yes, feel free to pop in with questions at any time. Uh, I don't have to talk the whole time. So that's why I brought so many clips. Um, anyway. Uh, I'm mostly an editor. That's what I, I know how to do. Uh, and uh, there are different ways to shape a story. And a lot of that 
is uh, determined by you know syntax, what order you put things in. Uh, just the simple act of associating two different shots together can create an entirely different meaning than what they really were. Uh, when we're talking about documentary films, I think you need to be careful of that, uh, that you're not implying that these people mean this when they really mean this. Um, and way back in the, uh, I, I never saw a definite date on this, but there's an experiment made by, uh, or done by two uh, Russian filmmakers, uh, Lev Kuleshov and, uh, I forget the first name, but Padovkin. And uh, they did a little experiment about, uh, you know, they basically had a whole bunch of uh, stock footage. Uh, and they stuck some of the shots together just to, uh, just to kind of prove that just by sticking two different shots together, it can create an entirely different meaning. And uh, so I've got a little example of that here. So hold on a second. <coughs> okay, if you can't tell, that's a plate of food. <laughs> and that was their actor. Um, oh, I wasn't supposed to go into this, but oh well. Okay, there's two different scenes going on there. Um, from the first scene, what did you think? You know, you, you saw the guy. What were you thinking when, we, when you first cut to him? He's hungry. He's hungry. Now, the next one, you see a woman inside of a coffin, and then you cut to him. What do you think? He's mourning. Mourning his mom. Well, probably not his mom. Hopefully, his wife or something. <laughs> but um, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, they actually had another, uh, another shot associated with, you know, the shot of the man is always the same shot. It's exactly the same shot. He does not change at all. Um, they actually had another one, but uh, th these were the only two that I found. There's this, uh, the third shot was a shot of a young girl playing with a teddy bear. And again, so you see that, and then you cut to this man again. So if you can picture that, what would you imagine the meaning of that would be? at least in the 1920s. Well, yeah, I, I, I would take it as he sees this girl and, oh, he's a loving dad watching his girl play or something like that. These days, who knows what this weird wacko guy is thinking. But anyway, um, so the, the whole idea behind that was that, that it was the exact same shot, and yet the audience got completely different meanings out of the other you know, the different scenes just because of what preceded that shot. Um, so in many ways, we as, you know, at least me as an editor and uh, some of you as filmmakers, you can imply something entirely different. Sometimes that might be good. Uh, you know, when you shoot something, especially documentary style, you can't make it, you know, you, you're not supposed to make it look like you're supposed, you know, like you want it sometimes. Um, and maybe when you watch it on screen, the audience doesn't know everything else that was happening around outside the, the frames of the, the TV. Uh, and maybe it doesn't quite make sense in that shot, but just by a, you know, putting a different shot next to it, that may change the meaning of it. But uh, uh, kind of along those same lines, we're going back to Joseph again. There is a scene that we cut out that it, uh, includes Alvin, his older brother, Joseph's older brother. And uh, he... Uh, that was one part of the show that I'm really sad we had to get rid of. When I first uh, started working on it, I was really, you know, they had this arc that basically they started with Alvin and just really built up Joseph's relationship with him and ended, it, ended with it. But when we had to cut it down, we lost a lot of Alvin's story. And this is one scene that, that got cut out. Uh, this is one of the shows that I was actually a co-editor on. There's another guy over at the Motion Picture Studio whose name is Cherry Stainer uh, that he was... He was basically the lead editor, and I was helping him uh, on other things. Uh, I, was, I did half of the scenes, and he'd do the other half, but he'd do the final compilation. But uh, uh, in this, oh, and Casey, this is the DVD, the, the other DVD. So I'll talk a few more minutes while that gets swapped out. Um, this, uh, 
So this scene basically has to do with Alvin. And so he cut this scene. I ended up cutting this scene. And I honestly can't remember which version it is. But uh, we're going to see two different versions of the same scene. Now, did you get two different meanings from those two scenes? Yeah. What did you get? The girl's response was different. Okay. There's only a few subtle differences in it, but to me, the, the, the meanings that I get from it when I watch it are worlds apart. Uh, and again, I forget which one I did, but one of them, you kind of get the idea that the, you know, he likes her, she likes him. The other one's like, you know, he likes her, obviously, but... Well, she's not so sure. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and there's only a few subtle differences. The only thing I could, you know, when I watched it last night again, you know, in one, she's already looking when he looks up, so she's already been admiring him, and so, um, and I can't remember what the other one is right now, but anyway, you kind of get my, the gist of it. But, uh, I, again, to me, it was, it was so odd to see, well, not odd, but it was kind of cool to see what he came up with and what I came up with and how just the tiniest difference can, can change the whole meaning of that scene. Um, I'm surprised it's already 22, so I'm getting a, uh, I guess I need to start wrapping up. But uh, um, again, with the, just back to the Guatemala thing, if any of you are thinking of going and you have the means to go, I'd definitely, uh, recommend it. I haven't been on any of the other ones that uh, the field study department, or I don't know if it's department, but the uh, uh, what they're sponsoring, but uh, the Guatemalan one is, is a blast. Uh, like I said before, that's where my wife went on her mission. I went to Mexico on mine, and that's where we always end up going on vacation, is down south instead of over to Europe or something, because we, we really like it. But uh, the people there are incredible, and uh, the more you can get to know them, the, the, the better your study will go, uh, and I think it'll it'll pay off on, you know, in your own life as well. Uh, just as a final note, oh, Casey, sorry, can we get the other one back in? Uh, thanks. Uh, this is going to explain the inotlate C a little bit. Uh, I, in addition to this uh, Kiche thing that I did, uh, the, the deforestation, I also did a an hour-long video for the students that went down, and that's where you get a lot of the real culture. But, uh, uh, I'm just going to include a little scene here. Yes, it is about me, but uh, I just mostly I, what I like about this is that it sh you know it shows people interacting with the people down there, and even though it's kind of in a dumb way, it uh, it's kind of a fun way, and apparently it helped them remember who I was.
<laughs> All right, so. Sorry, that was a little self-indulgence there, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just how to have fun in, in uh, Guatemala, I guess. But, uh, um, you yeah, know, that's a dumb talent I've had for quite a while is barking like a dog. And it's amazing what that'll do for you. So that's my other hint for you is learn how to make dumb animal noises and you'll make many friends. But uh, um, let's see. Are there any questions? There is a microphone in the back. If, yeah. Anything you want to know about uh, you know, some of the f feature films I've worked on? Uh, Are you working on oh, hold on a second. Oh. Good. Are you working on anything currently that you'd like to talk about? Um, well, over at the Motion Picture Studio, we just got done doing a series of Old Testament movies that will be released on DVD next year. I think Seminary is going to have first shot at them. Um, but uh, it, the idea is that uh, eventually everybody will have a shot at them. But what they're doing is they're, they're combining all the old Old Testament stuff, uh, re renovating some of it. Uh, yeah, and they did shoot five new shows, but the idea is they're going to have these DVDs that you can get that basically it covers a, a scripture block. You go into that. There won't be just a video, but there'll be moving text, stuff like that, just a whole bunch of other things other than videos as well, but uh, you know, all about the one scripture block. Uh, you know, their ideas that you can use in Sunday school, family home evening, uh, personal entertainment on Tuesday night, I guess. I, anyway. Um, outside projects, uh, I worked on a, uh, a film that should be coming out towards the end of the year called The, the Dance. Um, I, I really didn't do too much on that, but uh, did do a little bit. Uh, other than that, don't have anything on the slate on the outside. So no, but DI spots. But <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah, Malcolm, hold on a minute. You've had opportunities to work on documentary films, narrative features, and so forth. What's the biggest difference that you've seen as an editor or as as a in your different capacities and involvement in these different films between documentary and feature narrative type of films? Um, I think both heavily rely on story. If you don't have a good story, then either way it's going to, you know, the movie's going to stink. Uh, the biggest difference, I would say, is that one's scripted, one's unscripted. Um, you know what you're shooting in a feature film, uh, and even then you make dumb mistakes. Um, and so somebody somewhere along the line has to fix that or work around it or whatever, and that's usually the editor. Whereas in documentary, usually, you know, ideally you have an idea of what you're going for. You go down, shoot the best you can. Most of the documentary should be from the hip, you know. You know, hopefully you catch stuff. Uh, a lot of documentaries do set up stuff, reenactments, stuff like that, and I can understand that. Um, but, uh, you yeah, know, usually, even though they had an idea of what they're shooting, you're recreating the you're, you're creating the story in the editing room, and so documentaries definitely take a lot longer to uh, to edit than feature films do. Uh, I can usually have a pretty good picture, close to picture lock after about two months. They usually drag it out another two months or so, uh, and I'm talking about feature films, uh, just making little tweaks here and there, but. Um, on a documentary, they, they can be years. Uh, Leafi Uamu, which is the, the fire's burning one, that took, oh, I was one of three or four different editors and it took like three or four years to get done. Uh, let's see, Dodge Billingsley, who spoke here a few weeks ago, I heard, uh, one of his first ones that he did, The Immortal Fortress, uh, that took him quite a while, over a year, I believe. But uh, uh, my Kiche one took two years to get what I liked. Um, I had a version of it done after about six months, but I wasn't quite happy with it. And so, to me, that's the biggest difference. Is you're, you, on documentaries, you're usually dedicating a lot more time uh, to it. So, but yes. It's kind of a simple-minded question, but uh, how do you address the issue of getting uh, talent release forms 
getting them to sign? Uh, when I was down in Guatemala, I didn't know I was supposed to. <laughs> so I didn't get them, but uh, how to use, how to get, basically how to use the talent release form. Uh, and I definitely probably should have. My show really hasn't shown anywhere, so and it's shown on KBYU, and uh, it wasn't a, that big of an audience. And so they, they decided to just forgo that, but we figured that nobody from Santa Catarina Estavacan would be seeing the film. Uh, so they went with it. But uh, I'd heard something about it when I was a film student that I should get this, but I didn't do it. Uh, but I definitely should have. So, do you have a follow-up? Well, I, yeah, just as I was going to say, we've we've translated these things. We've taken what the BYU lawyers have have provided and put them into various languages. But then we've we have to go back and and, and try to put it into a culturally um, mm. authentic sort of way because the way we would say things in U.S. legalese is not the way that culturally these people are going to want to sign the thing. Right. So we've gone back and modified the English and then retranslated that. Uh, actually had to go go through this iteration, then run that back to the attorneys and say, well, will this work? So it, anyway, I just thought, wonder if you had any secrets. No, sorry. Um, I guess the closest thing I've had to that is a few weeks ago I worked on, a, they, they had a Latino cultural event up at the uh, church office, or the church conference center. And, we had to throw up a legal thing at the front end that was both English and Spanish, and they had a Spanish one already, but I basically had to create an English one on the, just from translating it from Spanish, and who knows if that was legal or, you know, if that covered all our bases, but uh, yeah, I, sorry, I don't have much help there, so. There was, I saw another hand somewhere. So when your film, or when the movie is filmed, whoever's filming it, how closely do the directors or the director, how do closely do they work with you when it seems like once the film is there that you're in charge? So how do they get the film that they saw? Well, that all depends on the, on the director. Uh, when you're talking, uh, if you're talking documentary, they usually are very heavily involved. Uh, they had the vision mo you know, more often than not. Uh, usually what will happen is they'll tell me what they want, they'll leave me alone, I'll do what I think I can do, and then uh, um, after that then they'll come back, look at it, any changes that they want done, I'll do those again. Uh, it, it all depends on the director and how hands-on he is. I have had some directors that are there the whole time saying, now let's do this, let's do this. Um, not necessarily telling me what to do, but what they want to try and do, and then I'll try and do it and see if we can make it happen. Uh, feature films, since it's all scripted and uh, whatnot, I've been given a lot more freedom during those uh, shows because they can leave me with the script and a few notes they'll come back, watch it for an hour or two, and say, okay, now do this, 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 and then they'll take off again, so. But usually it just depends on the director, so. I apologize if you mentioned this in the beginning, I was a little bit late, but um, what size crew did you have when you shot in Guatemala? It was me. And, um, and were you pleased with, with what you came up with, just you? I, I was quite happy. Uh, this was back even before they had mini DV, so I shot on high eight. Um, and uh, for high eight, I thought I got pretty good looking stuff. Um, you know, and, and on the interviews, it was always, I just set up the camera, I sat in front of the camera. So there were a few uh, mishaps that I had there because like one, I thought I had the camera going, but I guess I didn't hit the button. So I did this whole 40 minute interview and I was like, oh no. <laughs> had to go back and redo it, but uh, yeah, um, a lot of the shots were, were kind of on the run, and I, I'd heard this before that, oh, you, you think you can hold steady, but, you know, and I thought, well, I can do it. And he, yeah, even though you, you're, you're kind of up against a wall or something, even then, you you still got some slight movement. But, uh, and the weird thing about the camera I had, it, it, it had an anti-jitter or whatever it's called, uh, but it was in the early stages of that development. And so, in many cases, to me, it, it, it did pretty good when you did big jitters, but if you're just small little jitters, it, it made it even worse. And so, but uh, 
for the most part, I was pretty happy. Uh, most of the people did their interviews good and they stayed in frame and it was just a few little mishaps here and there. Uh, I think one, I didn't get audio because the audio plug wasn't plugged all the way in. I got video, but so um, it would have been nice to have somebody else there, but that way I could just run off. The coolest thing about it is I, I hiked around all over the place. Uh, you know, and, and you're out in the middle of this forest. It was the coolest, that was probably the coolest part about it for me, uh, besides the people, but. Let's see, a few other questions. If you had to, if you could take and do it again, what equipment would you have taken with you and how, what would you have done to make the process easier? You probably didn't have much electricity and things like that, lighting would have been difficult. How would you have changed that? Yeah, I did not take any lights down, so I had to just basically try and figure out how to do it with existing lights. I didn't even bring a bounce board. Um, and so for that, I think things turned out pretty good. What would I do different? Um, I know. I showed this to another guy that used to be down here, his name's Michael Van Wagnen, uh, and he said, now you need to go shoot it in 16, you know, on film, and uh, that's probably the main thing that I'd, I'd rather, if I were to do it again, I'd, I'd rather shoot on a higher quality format, whether it's tape or film. I'm a little bit hesitant to use film on a documentary just because now their HD tape is available, it looks pretty good. I personally still like film better, but it costs a whole bunch more, uh, especially if you're not going back to film for a final print. But uh, that's probably uh, probably what I'd do uh, is just shoot it on a better quality thing. Yeah, this in that case, this would be kind of a research video, and then I'd go on and do the actual thing. But uh, uh, probably ideally, I'd get uh, other interviews from people outside. Uh, the town, you know, more authoritative figures and stuff, but, uh, you know, I just, it was basically people inside the town and it was their opinion of it, so, anyway, did you have another question? Yeah, I think there's just one, last one. I was going to ask if you'd prefer a tripod to like a monopod or, and would you go, are you talking like real HD or like the fake Sony HD, I mean, because the real HD cameras are, I mean, yeah. the Panasonic's are pretty expensive. And so what would you really, I mean, more um, specific? In, in something like this, I'd probably, um, since the, eight, the real HD cameras are so big, you're pretty conspicuous. For me, since what I had was really consumer level, kind of, sort of, uh, just a step above it, uh, you know, but it was that size, I really got to go places and I was pretty inconspicuous. Um, and so probably just for that alone, I'd probably try and use one of these other formats. Uh, HDV seems to be doing pretty good. Uh, the hardest part there is finding some something to edit it on afterwards. You need to make sure, you know, I, I just got asked to work on this, uh, or help out on this documentary that some people at BYU are doing, and they took me to lunch and said, you know, give us some hints, what should we do before we go shoot? And I know one of the things I told them is make sure that the camera that you use will work on the editing software you want to use. They didn't. So they get back and they're trying to digitize stuff and it's like, it's not working. Well, yeah, it's not supported yet. Fortunately for them, they just hit, you know, Final Cut, it was Final Cut Pro they wanted to use. Final Cut Pro just came out with an update that now uses that camera. Otherwise, they would have been an up, up a nice little stream without hands even. But um, uh, So uh, I'd probably say the HD the, the, the kind of HDV and at least in something like this, it, it all depends on what you're doing, uh, project to project. In this case, I would definitely, you know, if I were to go back and do this again, I'd do one of the HDVs. Now, what was the other half of the tripod, question? Monopod. Tripod, monopod. Um, I've never used a monopod, but it's better than trying to do it handheld. Um, the one good thing about a monopod yeah, I'd only use those for, you know, things that you're trying to do standing up. Uh, definitely for an interview, you'd use the tripod. So if you can, I'd say take both. Uh, you know, I, I had a little, I didn't even have a, uh, a floating head uh, tripod, and so all my tilts and stuff were, I only used a few of them, let's just say that. <laughs> but, uh, How many hours of footage did you take in what they went? 
I shot about 22 hours of footage. Now, some of that, like I said, I, I did a, a memory video for some of the other students, and so some of that was used expressively for that. Actual footage for the, the thing, for the actual video was probably about 11 hours, I'd say. And this is going on 12, or what, eight years of memory, so. But uh, that's about how much.